Friday within the octave of Corpus Christi, the epistle is taken from the first letter of St. Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians. Brethren, the tradition which I received from the Lord and handed on to you is that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was being betrayed, took bread and gave thanks and broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body given up for you. Do this for a commemoration of me. And so with the cup, when supper was ended, this cup, he said, is the New Testament in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, for a commemoration of me. So it is the Lord's death that you are heralding, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, until he comes. And therefore, if anyone eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily, he will be held to account for the Lord's body and blood. A man must examine himself first, and then eat of that bread and drink of that cup. He is eating and drinking damnation to himself, if he eats and drinks unworthily, not recognizing the Lord's body for what it is. And the Holy Gospel is a continuation of that according to St. John. At this time, Jesus said to the Jewish crowd, My flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives continually in me and I in him. As I live because of the Father, the living Father who has sent me, so he who eats me will live in his turn because of me. Such is the bread which has come down from heaven. It is not as it was with your fathers, who ate manna and died nonetheless. The man who eats this bread will live eternally. How merry for the grace the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary Mother, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. me, beloved in Christ, welcome to this broadcast mass on this, as we said, the Friday in the octave of Corpus Christi. Such is the Church's joy that uh, she enables us to celebrate for eight consecutive days this wonderful feast in thanksgiving for the institution of the Holy Eucharist. It is, as it were, uh, overcompensating perhaps for the fact that on Monday Thursday, when our Lord instituted uh, the Holy Eucharist, we of course are unable to celebrate with quite the joy and thanksgiving that we would like to, or that it is possible for us to do with all our means, because uh, of it situated as it is on the night before, or the day before Good Friday. So it is, as you may recall, that Holy Mother Church developed these devotions and this manner of celebration so that uh, though perhaps in many respects we ought to celebrate in thanksgiving every day, and indeed to an extent Holy Mother Church does wherever the Holy Eucharist is celebrated, and it is the tradition of course generally for the Holy Eucharist to be celebrated daily, nonetheless particularly and specifically and specially we celebrate for these eight days continuously the wonderful gift of the sacrament of Christ's love, the most holy and blessed sacrament of the altar. Now I speak about daily, I'm sure, I know, uh, you will be familiar with the Paternoster, with the Our Father, a prayer that our Lord Jesus himself gave to the Apostles when the disciples asked, Lord, teach us to pray. Now there is a very special Greek word in the context of the Lord's Prayer that is not seen anywhere else in the New Testament, it is not used anywhere else in the Testament, and it occurs, and uh, sorry, and it speaks to the Blessed Sacrament itself. It speaks to the bread of life, and that word is ebusus, which is the word for daily. Give us this day our daily bread, ebusus. But ebusus uh, means rather than daily, though it is translated as daily, it means really super-essential. That is its literal translation, super-essential. What we are praying is give us this day our super-essential bread. 
Now remember elsewhere in the scripture our Lord himself says, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So although in one sense and in a first reading uh, we might interpret, give us this day our daily bread, as a petition to receive that which we need to sustain us materially and physically in this life, it does indeed mean that, but it also means something more than that. It is specifically referencing the Holy Eucharist, the bread of life, the super essential bread. This bread of which our Lord himself tells us is his flesh and his blood, the only means by which we are guaranteed eternal life. Baptism gives us salvation, the Holy Eucharist gives us eternal life. Remember that that subtext of the Johannine Gospel, of St John's Gospel, that our citizenship of heaven begins with our baptism, begins with from the moment of our salvation, when we have died to self and been risen anew in Christ, we become citizens of heaven. And so to be sustained as citizens of heaven, we receive this bread of eternal life, this panis angelorum, this bread of the angels, this bread which is not like that bread of manna which fell from heaven and was given to the Israelites in exile to sustain them, but rather, as our Lord says in the Gospel today, a bread that gives eternal life. Yes, sure enough, uh, we will eat this bread, if you want to reduce it to its base element, we will eat this bread, and sure enough, we will die, physically. But we who eat this blessed bread, we who eat this Eucharist, are eating eternal life, and we will continue to, and on, in eternal life, even though, and despite, our physical Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our super essential bread. Now this is important, my brothers and sisters, for us to uh, remember concerning the Eucharist. There are, of course, other, uh, uh, other Christian traditions uh, about the Lord's Supper. And yet the Catholic Orthodox tradition has always been the same everywhere and held by all. That the Eucharist is truly the body and blood of Christ. It is for this reason that St Paul writes what he does to the Corinthians. That reading that we just heard from St Paul, in context, St Paul is writing to the Corinthians, admonishing them about the way in which some of them were behaving when they came together. Now you may remember, cast your minds back to Acts of the Apostles, which are the witness account, which is the witness, eyewitness account of St. Luke. He is the author, uh, not just of the Gospel, uh, but also of the Acts of the Apostles. And he there, in chapter 2, tells us that the Christians met daily together to break bread. Then they shared uh, their things, their material things, according to need, and ate together, shared meals together. Now these meals are what later would be uh, called agape, feasts. And sometimes, particularly around Holy Week, unfortunately perhaps, uh, it is the tradition of some churches to have hold such agape feasts. It is as regrettable as those who uh, also pretend to hold seders, Christian Passovers. Very wrong, but I won't digress there now. Uh, but uh, the agape feast. Now the agape feast, agape, remember, is a word for love, but it is a word for love that really speaks to friendship. Caritas, charity, means, recalling, remember, sacrificial love. Agape love really means friendship love, communal love. So it is that the meals described in Acts of the Apostles of the early Christians and what the early Christians were practicing in Corinth, of these agape uh, feasts, were shared fellowship meals. 
what today perhaps we might understand as potluck suppers or bring and share lunches. Now any of you who have ever been or participated in a potluck supper or a bring and share lunch will know what St Paul is referring to or why he's uh, writing to the Corinthians about some of the behaviour of some of them. Because some of them perhaps were richer than others and so were bringing nice wine they were bringing nice meats and nice fruits, which they weren't necessarily sharing with everyone else. Rather than being agapeg and being friendly and sharing everything in common, as the apostles did in Jerusalem, rather it seems that there had grown this practice amongst some Christians of withholding, not being quite as charitable as they ought to be, holding back enjoying for themselves and keeping for themselves what they perhaps perceive to be the fruits of their own labour or of their own particular blessing of God's providence meant only for them. And that is what St Paul is writing to the Corinthians about in this letter, admonishing them concerning the Eucharist and concerning the Agapeg feast. And so he exhorts them in this section that we read is the epistle for the, in the octave of Corpus Christi. He admonishes them and reminds them about what the Eucharist is. So it is not confused, so it cannot be confused with the Agapeg feast that they are otherwise enjoying after the Eucharist. But here my point that I'm hopefully trying to make is that there is a difference between the Eucharist and the Agapeg feast. There's a difference between the Eucharist, the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the worship of Almighty God, the reliving and representation of Calvary from the communal fellowship and sharing of a meal. Now this point is important because particularly in the last 50 years uh, or more, um, since uh, the 60s, it has uh, become quite a popular uh, trait or understanding or of, the, uh, of the Mass or of the Eucharist to emphasise it as a communal meal. There is an overemphasis in some contemporary liturgies seeking to uh, emphasise the Church coming together as a people and the Church gathering together to share a common meal, which is why sometimes rather uncharitably perhaps and euphemistically uh, altars moved away from the wall and celebrated in the round are called the kitchen table and gone and reduced is the understanding, the key and very important understanding and appreciation that the Mass is the holy sacrifice of Calvary, that the altar is the altar of the cross. Yes, we may draw, of course, parallels, allegories to the table of the Lord's Supper. We may draw uh, allegories to the table of the banquet of the Lamb in heaven. But it is called an altar and not a table specifically because it is a, a place of sacrifice. It is the place where the cross, the sacrifice of Christ of the love of God upon the cross of Calvary is represented for us in, yes, an unbloody fashion, but yet through which we receive the blood of Christ, through which we receive his body broken for us in bread and upon which we celebrate remembering the lives of those who have gone before us. Remember both common uh, to the east and to the west is the tradition of saints relics, of martyrs relics being included either in or upon the altar where the Eucharist is celebrated, where the holy sacrifice of Calvary is represented honouring those saints who have died, who have shed their blood 
for the sake of his blood shed for them. The Mass too, and this is very important, the Mass too is about the worship of Almighty God. It is not necessarily about the people. The Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is the worship of Almighty God by the people. The byproduct, as it were, of their worship of Almighty God in the Mass is the reception then of the gift of the sacrament of His love, the gift of eternal life, by an assured means in His body and in His blood, in the bread and in the wine. In that sense, it is for the people. But ultimately, the first primary principle, of course, and purpose of the Holy Mass is the worship of Almighty God. This is the representation of that which went on at Calvary and goes on in heaven, where, described in the letter of the uh, Hebrews, Christ is described as our eternal high priest, who is continually offering himself, continually interceding for us, continually interceding for us to God the Father, and continually offering himself as priest and victim in satisfaction for the sins of the world. The fruits and the benefit of which is realized only for those who acknowledge their sin, who accept his sacrifice and salvation for their sins, who then sacrifice themselves in love for him. They then receive eternal is they who will then share in the glory of transformation, of transfiguration, of the resurrection body, to be bathed in the resurrection light for all eternity. Perhaps you can see how contemporary liturgies have robbed so many people of the truth of not just the gospel message but of the truth of the worship that is due to Almighty God. The purpose of coming together. Yes, we come together as the body of Christ. Yes, we come together communally to worship. But we come to worship Him. We come primarily to Him. It is nice that we can come together it is nice that we greet each other before Mass. It is nice that we spend time with each other after Mass. Perhaps it is nice that we share a potluck uh, meal or a bring and share lunch. That is nice. That is not why we come. We come first to Mass to worship God. And this is why the long tradition of the Church in both East and West has been for the priest to face the altar, to face God, because it is not him but Christ who is the bridge, who is the intercessor, who is leading the flock to the Father, to the eternal home. It is for that reason that our vestments are richly decorated on the reverse, traditionally, so that the identity of the priest himself is lost and subsumed into that action of being in persona Christi, being in the person of Christ. It's Christ through him who offers the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It is Christ himself who breathes the words, the transforming words, the very words of life and creation transforming bread and wine into his body and blood. That same breath, that same word of God that created all things without whom nothing is made. It is for that reason that the last gospel is that from St. John, the very beginning 
Apostle John is proud of. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We reflected on this the other day again, about Ruach and Logos, and about Genesis. It is the same Word, creation Word, that transforms the eighth elements of bread and wine into his body and blood. Remember what, how, what we reflected yesterday about our faith being incarnational, and it is no accident that our Lord uses bread and wine, that he chose bread and wine. We know that some other traditions alter the species using different types of, various different types of bread or biscuit, using uh, other substances than wine, which is a travesty because our Lord himself instituted and chose those elements think about those elements. This is one thing that a contemporary liturgy does make uh, the point very well. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. citizens of 